lot of presentations. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Crystal Robeson, the Public Health Research Representative of the National Child Passenger Safety Board and a Senior Research Associate, associate with the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. It is my honor to serve as your MC for today's CPS Coordinators Forum. We would love to know who's joining us today, so feel free to enter your name and state in the chat box. And today happens to be National California Day, so special shout out to all the Californians joining us today. As a California native, that's near and dear to my heart. If only we could all go celebrate the trip to In-N-Out. And next slide, Jeff. Uh, as a reminder, please do not participate in this forum if you are driving. The presentation will be recorded and you can listen to the recording when you arrive safely at your destination. Next slide. Uh, please enter your questions in the chat box if you have them. Um, and if time allows, we will answer the questions uh, today or we will follow up as appropriate by our presenters. Um, we have a number of presenters today. So if you are able and you're addressing your question to one person, please indicate who that's for so we can more easily tell who to address your questions towards. Okay. So we are really excited to bring you a very full um, agenda today. Um, and the entire purpose of today's, pre of today's uh, list of present presenters is to give everyone a flavor of some of the different uh, program, what some of the different programs are doing with regard to keeping their um, technicians certified and how we're doing those trainings. So we're hoping that everybody has some fresh ideas by the end of today. Um, so our first presenter is going to be Marsha French. Uh, and Marcia is the program director of the Automotive Safety Program and National Center for the Safe Transportation for Children with Special Health Care Needs at Indiana University School of Medicine. Marcia is a CPSTI and a Master Certified Health Education Specialist. Marcia, take it away. Thank you so much, Crystal, for asking us to present today. We are going to talk a little bit about in-person um, conferences in the state of Indiana. We are um, funded by our state highway safety office to do the training throughout our state. And we also put on um, courses throughout our state, as well as certification courses, recertification courses, and our state annual conference. So I'm going to talk about our state annual conference. Our model that we use currently is a two-day conference within in-person seat check event. So I'm going to talk about both things in 12 minutes to 15 minutes. And Jessica is going to keep me um, on my time so that I don't take up too much time. Um, the most important thing I can recommend as you are planning um, your dates of your conference is to really take a look at the Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety website and look at the other conferences that are being planned and making sure that your dates do not interfere with other dates of conferences so that you can ensure that you will have car seat manufacturers joining your conference, national speakers that you would like to invite um, may be able to join your conference and really to avoid um, any interference for maybe some other travelers that may be joining your conference. We also try to avoid large CPS conferences. So whether that's Lifesavers, um, the Chem Conference or PrevCon, we also look at the National CPS Board meetings because we do have um, a current board member. Well, we did have two current board members in our state, but we have one current board member in our state right now, Dr. Marilyn Bull. So we try to work around that as well so that she can attend um, and take and participate in our conference as well. So that is kind of the number one tip I would recommend to everyone because we have accidentally scheduled our conference at the same time period as another conference last year. I do understand that. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about location. So we have a goal of finding a location for about 200 technicians. We average anywhere from about 1,200 to 1,350 technicians here in the state of Indiana. Um, so we look for about 200 to come to Indianapolis for the um, conference every year. We wanna have an exhibit space for manufacturers and we want to be able to keep them all in one space. Um, 
we used to be able to have a space that we could have the manufacturers in the same room we were presenting, but unfortunately we're not able to do that because we have grown a little bit, but we do have the manufacturers all in an exhibit space together. You also want to think about your AV expenses. There are a lot of places that AV obviously has been um, really built into a lot of places that offer conference services, but you really have to think about if they're going to charge you for an AV tech as well, because that can get very expensive because it's usually an hourly rate. And then you have to think about if you're having an in-person conference, are you also going to offer virtual participation or are you going to offer um, the chance, say your national speaker can't come in person, but they're able to offer the comfort, the session virtually, are you able to have them present virtually? So that's something that can be a bit challenging um, if you have a mostly in-person um, conference. We also look for a space that's going to give us free parking, which can be a little bit challenging in a downtown um, larger metropolis area. Um, we just happen to be working with one of our local community colleges that gives us free parking for our conference um, that we are planning for this year. We also look for a place that will store um, the car seats that the manufacturers are shipping and that they can ship directly to the conference location. This really helps us. Um, from making multiple trips from our office and then really from our office getting crowded with lots of supplies and materials and car seats before the conference is taking place. And then we also look for a place or a location that will let us not only host our two day conference at their location, but also that has a parking lot that we can utilize to host our annual car seat clinic. So with our two-day conference, we have one full day um, of conference sessions for CEUs. And then at the end of the first day, we do have a car seat clinic that's open to the public. And I'm going to talk about that at the very end. And then the second day, we come back and do a whole second day of CEUs. And we usually have a community event on that day, as well, our community education session on that day. And I think Jessica I may have lost control. It didn't move the slide. Thank you. These were just a couple of little pictures that I wanted to kind of put up, just some spaces and some challenges we've had in the past. Um, so you can see the space on the left-hand side. It's a beautiful ballroom. It's actually here on the campus of IUPUI, actually Indiana University, Indianapolis now. Um, but you can see that they did not have AV built into the room. So it was something that had to be added to the room in the past. So that wasn't ideal for us. And we had someone trip over the cord. That was not very fun. And we had outgrown that space. Um, you can also see, they had to put the um, food in the hallway, which is not great because then you're constantly going back and forth. Um, we just did not have enough space in that ballroom. Um, the other suggestion I would make is that when you are going to feed people, which everyone loves food, right? And I don't know about anyone else that hosts an in-person conference, but CPS technicians, they like to eat. So we like to make sure that we have two lines um, of food going so that everyone can eat quickly and we get people sitting down so that they can enjoy the next session um, that we have going on. A couple of things about these two photos. Uh, this is also here on campus at um, IUPUI. So the photo on the right is an auditorium. Our, our, our audience here in Indiana does not love the auditorium. It doesn't give them space to kind of interact with the person next to them sitting at a table. They liked it as far as being able to visually see the screens pretty easily. Um, but this auditorium had also just um, had a complete remodel and we weren't allowed to take any food or drinks in there. So that's something you definitely want to discuss um, with your venue to make sure that you can have um, 
your food and snacks in your different locations. And then on the left, you can see it's like an atrium outside of this auditorium. And that's where we had to put um, our car seat manufacturers that were exhibiting that year. And we had them in that hallway and down another hallway. So they weren't all in one space. So they were kind of spread out. And I don't think we had as much participation um, during that year. When you're thinking about planning your agenda or your sessions, it's super important to think about what sessions the audience in your state, um, what they are interested in. So what we do is we look at evaluations from the previous year from our conference, but we also send out a technician survey usually around October. So at the beginning of our fiscal year, whether that's via Qualtrics, Microsoft Forms, um, or Google Forms to kind of say, hey, these are all the different topics that we think may be interesting. Can you rate them on a scale of one to five how interesting they are so that we can see what our audience really wants in Indiana so that we are getting important topics and sessions that they want. Our goal for each day, so each day we want five to six CEUs and we want a community education event or session each day. So that essentially, if we had someone that was coming to our conference and they were, could only come for one day, then they would get all of their, um, or hopefully most of their CEUs and their edu uh, community education. So we look for current hot topics. Obviously, we always plan for the manufacturers panel, and I know Danielle is going to talk more about that later. If we have multiple panels, we want them all in one day so that we don't have one panel on one day and one panel on the other. All the manufacturers usually one session after the other. We do speed mentoring sessions sometimes, so we'll have 20 minute sessions and we're rotating to different tables. Our technicians love that for delivering quick information, but lots of different topics. Our technicians love games. So last year, Courtney Berry used Kahoot to deliver some information via a CEU session, and it was a huge hit with our audience. I know Sarah Haverstick has used a Jeopardy game in the past, and our audience always loves that as well. And take advantage of the Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety. They will present different sessions that they have worked on as a group as well, and they are a great tool to use for CEU sessions as well. We do something a little special for our speakers and our manufacturers that are coming. We, the night before our conference begins, we have a welcome dinner for them. This is sponsored by our Department of Pediatrics. This is for us to network, to, to discuss any um, hot topics, conference topics, industry challenges, and it gives us a little bit of time um, to really connect with our speakers and manufacturers before the conference begins because my team and I are usually running around um, and super busy during the conference. Registration, you can use any um, free platform. We have used Eventbrite in the past. You have to think about if you are charging a fee, using the appropriate fiscal agent. And I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm trying to really quickly get through this information. Um, we also recruit our clinic volunteers this way, and we ask them to give us their experience level by how many maybe recertification cycles they've completed and how many seat checks they've done in the year, and then if they speak any other languages. That helps us make sure that we have other languages available for our clinic. I'm going to skip this slide and talk about our clinic. So most importantly, when you're planning a clinic, safety, safety, safety. A couple of years ago, I know some of the people on this call were probably at this car seat clinic right here in 2017, where we had a typhoon of a rainstorm and we did not have a good safety plan. We have mitigated that and we have a great safety plan. Super important to involve your community partners, um, have an inspirational speaker. We have a clinic brief before we leave our conference to go to the clinic. And that way we can tell everyone the logistics of the clinic, how the clinic's going to run, and then the inspirational speaker kind of talks about why what we do is so important. This is more about logistics of the car seat clinic, having cones, recycling, trash pickup, having lots of volunteers from outside organizations, 
interpreters, having team captains. We do color coded hats so that the technicians can identify them and huge key communication, communication, communication. We send lots of emails out about our car seat clinic and you can see here our lovely little layout. And sponsorships, something I wanna mention very quickly is sponsorships don't have to just be monetary. They can be notebooks for your clinic. They can be t-shirts. They can be notebooks for your conference, sorry, not clinic. They could be bags. Um, they can be water and snacks for your car seat clinic. They can be donations um, from local teams, businesses, car seat manufacturers. We have worked with Costco and Sam's and BJ's to get gift cards to buy supplies for our car seat clinics and volunteers to set up before the clinic and during the clinic. We work with a lot of local businesses um, that help give us volunteers that are very impactful for our large car seat clinic. And sending the personal thank you notes afterwards is huge. There's my contact information and back to you, Crystal or Jessica. Thank you so much, much Martha. That was really great. I'm sure we're gonna have some great questions about that um, towards the end. Um, but to keep things moving, I, we are gonna pass the baton to Petra Stanton um, and she is an MSW and CPSTI um, from John Hopkins All Children's Hospital, Safe Kids, Florida Suncoast. Uh, Petra has been at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital for nearly 12 years. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, she has been a certified child passenger safety technician since 2007 and became an instructor in 2011. Uh, she is also a staff certified instructor. Petra leads a very active intervention program and also a robust child passenger safety program in the state of Florida. So Petra, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to all of the other presenters. So some of this uh, information will be similar to what Marsha was sharing before me. Uh, so knowing your audience is obviously a big um, component of scheduling of any informational session, but uh, I wanted to get it out there. I'm originally from the Czech Republic. I do not want people thinking about where is her accent from while I'm presenting. That's what I uh, like to clear up. And we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, we are a pediatric, a freestanding uh, pediatric specialty hospital. I included these slides because I'm not necessarily a state co coordinator. However, we were able to um, have a couple of several technical updates that we did virtually that are becoming in alliance with our state. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that I work for Johns Hopkins All Children, which is in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we are a freestanding pediatric hospital. Next, please. And this is our outreach area. Uh, we are on the west coast of Florida and we go anywhere from uh, Fort Myers all the way to Citrus County, although we can get patients from anywhere in the state and depending on what specialty they need from across the country. Thank you. Next, please. Okay, so uh, my job at the hospital is to be a Safe Kids supervisor. I used to be a Safe Kids coordinator. Uh, many of you know what Safe Kids is, but it is a national organization that focuses on uh, preventing unintentional injuries and they have research-based ba campaigns and engage in advocacy. Our local coalition, we are the lead agency. I'm in a supervisory role and have um, two other full-time position and a per diem position that reports to me. So uh, it will come in handy in uh, some of my future slides. We, uh, as far as safe kids, uh, concentrate on five uh, counties around the Tampa Bay area. Okay, so what we do each year, we uh, identify the common mechanisms of injuries and uh, do uh, layers of intervention of how we want, want to tackle these. And I have been in the position for about 12 years and motor vehicle crashes, as I'm sure all of you are familiar, always seem to come up when it comes to deaths, but also injuries, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, uh, any EMS data. So, um, Based on that, that the, the layers of intervention, um, I think of it this way. If we are able to certify more people, 
uh, they will be able to help more families. Therefore, more children will be protected if they get into car crashes. We also want to provide technical updates, and this is where this presentation comes in handy. So now we certified all of these people, and we, pro we probably offer 10 to 12 certification trainings a year. It's a lot to take in because we travel to all those five counties with all the supplies. But we want our technicians to re remain active, remain certified, and that therefore we feel like we need to provide them with the opportunities to earn the CEUs in a timely fashion and so on, because everybody loves the last minute call like, hey, can you sign me off? I expire tomorrow, right? So, um, which I feel all of these layers expand the parent services and therefore protect more children. We also tend to develop a network resources for our coalition members so they can refer to other agencies. So some background information about our technical update that we now call uh, Buckle Up for Love. So the history was uh, we received, and Stephanie as one of our later speakers, she remembers this, this uh, as the Safe Kids funding for the State Farm Reunion. In the past, it used to be hosted on the West Coast and all, uh, on the East Coast, so we alternate it. Uh, our um, technical update was scheduled for March 18th, and th there were rumors about a week prior that there will be a shutdown for COVID, right? And so probably five days out, uh, uh, the technical update, the in-person uh, technical get update got canceled. We did have some manufacturers uh, send us seats. So thank you, Daniela, because I still use your um, <laughs> a baby for our training. And it's a very common seat in our area, but that's how I got that one. The attendance in our area used to be 80 to 100 participants from um, across Florida. And, and we considered that a success, but uh, because we had to, on March 17th, we had to take our stuff and go home. We had to find a different way because I felt responsible since I received the uh, grant funding. So um, thinking about this, I had to consider my resources. And I was fortunate enough that one of the manufacturers, uh, national representatives happened to move into our area. And it's Sarah Haverstick from Good Baby International. And so, so, and she belongs to our local safe kids here. So we started talking about this and I was like, listen, Sarah, I have this, this funding for the State Farm Reunion. Can we work on something virtually? And so um, we started working on that and we had a, uh, we also considered our partnerships in terms of how are we going to share this? And mind you, this was probably, um, March, six months. So we offered it in September the first time around for CPS week. Uh, so, so who can we use to help uh, us and how can we get technicians there? So the partnership similar to what Marsha was saying, can we, can we uh, enthuse the technicians by offering um, some giveaways that we can send to them and so on. And that's how we chose to spend the money. Uh, I also say uh, your willingness to work and offer um, offer these to uh, your um, information or be willing to, to to the technicians out there because sometimes uh, I will get a Facebook Messenger message. And I want to say uh, supportive colleagues is also uh, really, important because so our first buckle up for love technical update was in September for CPS week we did not call it that uh, but many of you know that Sarah um, got sick and we sort of took a break but when she returned um, she was able to offer us with a zoom of a capacity of 1000 right and at that time we had probably 250 people registered and i felt like the 700 spaces were going wasted for technicians who could really really possibly use the ceus for example those who are unable to travel to in person conferences so i also reached out to stephanie and i asked for the list of um all safe kids technicians um in the country because we had 750 spaces available 
Um, I started emailing. My Outlook only allowed us to send, I thought at that time, 200 per time. So uh, the number of technicians we were trying to reach was 18,600 that year uh, nationally. So that was going really slow. And a couple of hours into me emailing, maybe four hours into emailing, I asked my very supportive colleagues and they are like, let's split this. We've got this, you know, so know you that you, your colleagues are there and it became the 750 spots probably filled within two to three hours from us finishing those emails. So uh, just willingness to be creating, willingness to work and supportive colleagues. And don't be afraid to ask for help because I don't know if anybody on this call can relate to this. Sometimes asking for help is really challenging. So we also um, wanted to make sure uh, that we have our um, state resources and alliances they may differ from state to state. Uh, I have not recently researched all the states in the United States, but I uh, I have recently seen, for example, the instructor payments and gra some grants from California, and they're very different from Florida. So what might be available from state to state uh, might be different. So be familiar with uh, what is uh, the resource most appropriate to be used for this in your state. Florida Occupant Protection Safety Coalition. So we have an Occupant Protection Safety Coalition and those will be your ally, uh, allies in your state. So uh, I have emailed all of the instructors who, uh, who are on that committee to share that with them. Also, our sa state Safe Kids coordinator, and they have a resource center. So their resource center shared the information and the registration links with the state of Florida. So gain an understanding of opposing view. And this goes back to um, when you are setting up your workshops um, or even materials to follow up. Uh, it, we may have, uh, law enforcement ha may have a different view than somebody, especially in Florida, than somebody who is trying to promote best practice. So be cognizant of what the, of, of, audience, what your audience is and what you want them to hear and how you want them to receive it and learn about populations and cultures in your state. We have some very rural areas. We have some very busy uh, urban areas. So make sure your um, presentation is for everyone. So how we did it. Um, so I, I would like to, on the left, the picture shows our email that was sent out. And we were thinking that the simpler, the better, because emails, we all get thousands and thousands of emails. They get lost in our boxes. So we were like, if we are emailing this many people, it has to be straightforward um, and clear. Even then, people had a lot of questions. One of them asked me if this was real because it was red and pink. However, it worked for us to fill it up. And your marketing resources, important to don't forget Chatterbox and so on. There are Facebook groups or social media groups that may be in your benefit because they are connected to other technicians that may not be on your list. And uh, make sure that somebody answers the questions. And I, I mentioned that earlier. So uh, do we have a branding? We originally did not have branding and we still do not have um, necessary branding. But as this conference grew, we held our third one just finished on Friday. I'm thinking, uh, and we had probably 900, about eight to 900 in each one of the workshops. We may look into branding and expanding um, our um uh, our resources to the more technicians, just so it's more recognizable. So this was what was sent from our state. And as you can see, it's very generic. You don't know who, who is putting it on, but it came from the state because of the alliances, but we want it to be recognizable now. So if the day is here, uh, I love that this webinar was 30 minutes earlier for the presenters. Uh, and oh, thank you, Marsha. Uh, we are so happy that uh, 
the presenters are able to get online and get situated, right? Most technology is great, except for when it's not. So it's always best to be prepared and know your speakers. Uh, if you have in person, have a pl uh, plan if participants arrive early or late. And it is the same for the web. Uh, we obviously didn't have uh, breakfast and networking, but we do a little warm and fuzzy similar to what we did here introductions uh ceus uh and uh, we want to make sure uh, ceus obviously are good for the technicians but we want to make sure that the technical updates were also rewarding for our speakers so we have a good rapport with them and when we invite them they would be able to come back and uh, i always say these next year if that's what you want to here and ask for feedback if you can, um, if you have the opportunity. I, I really like what Marsha did. Here is my contact information. If you have any questions, please con feel free to email me. I will be back at the end. We do announce these on our Facebook page and other Facebook. So follow us at Sanco Safe Kids. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Petra. That was great. It's quite nice to hear that virtual perspective and shift. So. Um, we will catch back up with you with questions when you get to your destination. Okay, so next up we have Bevan Curley and Alan Buchanan. Um, they are from North Carolina, and the North Carolina Child Passenger Safety Program is coordinated through a partnership of three agencies, the UNC Highway Safety Research Center and the NC Department of Insurance, which is Safe Kids North Carolina, um, have funding provided by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. Bevan and Allen are two of North Carolina State CPS contacts. They are both uh, child passenger safety technician instructors and have many years of child passenger safety experience. All right, Allen and Bevan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Crystal. So we're gonna kick this off. Uh, hello everybody, good afternoon. So give you a quick overview, uh, North Carolina, we have a large technician base here. We have about 3,200 technicians. Uh, across our state, uh, which is about, which is 100 counties. Um, so every year we actually have our approximately 1600 technicians that need to recertify. There is a lot of CEUs that we have to offer to make sure that we maintain our technicians. So we try to be very creative um, and take our, you know, do what we can to offer these CEUs the best way we can to keep technicians recertified. Uh, keep in mind with our state, it's a big state and there's a lot of rural areas in our state. So we have to be very creative. Uh, next, please. So we do offer a large multi-day conference or a couple of conferences every year, but they're not really conducive to the everyday technician for several reasons. The good part about it is it does provide a lot of in-person networking opportunities. Uh, that's great. It's great for hands-on learning. Um, you know, people really get to get together to actually be creative and see each other and put the hands on different things. But unfortunately, uh, conferences can be expensive and people just can't take the time off from work. Uh, two, three days away from work is not really conducive for a lot of our technicians. And the conferences tend to be in more urban areas. So it does create a little travel burden on those who live in our rural communities. So uh, they are some of the challenges really to consider uh, as far as the conferences go. If you would just click the button, uh, just do one click for me. Thank you. So webinars are another option um, that we also offer also. There's of course both uh, in-state opportunities that we offer and then of course there's national opportunities that technicians can participate. The advantage is they are free and they are quick but the disadvantage is they really don't provide any network opportunities and the hands-on learning just isn't there. And a lot of our technicians learn really well by putting their hands on different things, depending on what the subject may be. So we really have been creative and uh, creative a unique concept. Our CPS Symposia really offers the best of these two worlds um, all in one like neat bundle. And next please. So our regional one day symposia, we have offered quite a few of these across our state. And if you look, the red is where we actually have offered them in the past and the yellow is where we are actually going this year. So we try to be very, um, you know, thought provocative and where we actually put these. Uh, we try, do try to go to the rural locations throughout our state. Uh, this simply kind of bring the training to them. 
um, is a one-day training event. It focuses mainly on hands-on interactive learning. And the advantage is attendees can get all six CEUs in one setting. And the biggest advantage is it's free to all attendees, which is a huge advantage when you live in a rural community. Uh, next, please. So how in the world can we offer something free? Well, you gotta be a little, um, you know, have some creativity. So as far as the locations, there are a lot of free locations that are available that come ready to go. Um, think about your libraries, your government buildings, your community colleges, well, the case may be, I think we even use an agriculture center for one of our, our CPS symposiums. You can ask local partners for help. Um, like I said, most of these are free if the local, and sometimes it takes a local agency requesting it, but use your partnerships, use your local contacts. They're always more than willing to help. And there's a lot of great locations out there that we've been lucky to find and use some creativity in finding them. Uh, we don't really, we don't offer meals, uh, so we do like the location to be somewhere where lunch is accessible, so we do give an hour break for lunch, uh, we do send the attendees out for lunch, and I think most of the attendees like that because they get a little break um, from, you know, just the atmosphere they're in and get to uh, decompress, kind of absorb what they're learning. And of course, as far as staff, there is a cost as far as that, but our actual CPS grant does cover our travel and our time. So it's really not any burden on our agencies as far as covering that. So it's really a win-win opportunity with very little cost, if any, to our agencies to be able to offer these. And of course, thanks to our Governor's Highway Safety Program, that's great. So when you come to choosing a location, uh, we do look for an area with a large number, uh, I'm sorry, a large percentage of techs up for recertification. Now, keep in mind, you know, a lot of urban areas have a large number of technicians that need recertifications. But when we look at the percentage, it does make a difference. So for example, you know, we may have a fire department that sent their whole department through to get trained all in one class. Well, they will all be up for recertification in one setting or one time. So we do look at the percentage when we actually look to plan these um, type of events because it does make a big difference. So um, when you're planning these, I encourage you to use percentages. Uh, most of these are rel relatively accessible for both the sta um, for staff and non-local attendees. So we, as far as the location, we try to make it accessible as you know, easy as possible. We already talked about the lunch options. Having that lunch option is a, you know, something you need to think about because it doesn't need to be a 30 minute drive to get lunch and then come back because you will burn some time there. But just some things to consider. So now I'll turn it over to Bev and she's gonna talk about space. So when we're doing this, obviously when we think for our large state conferences, we're looking usually for, you know, large spaces like hotel ballrooms or you know convention centers and and that's not something we're necessarily going to find in these rural communities and so you know our advice to you is be flexible we will make it work in pretty much any space um these are some examples of spaces that we've used you know the top is as alan said an agricultural center they just had they had some rooms you know around us there were farm equipment and horses and whatever but they had this nice room in the middle that worked just fine We've got a technical college, had a, an auditorium. We use the hallways, you know, we, we, we're flexible. We'll make it work. And we encourage you to think about what do you truly need to make this happen? You need tables, you need chairs, maybe depending on your content, you need some space for hands-on activities, but, you know, boil it down to what is the bare minimum you need to be successful. And you'll find that there are probably spaces that fit your need in that community. Um, some of them are going to be larger than others, and we just modify our total capacity based on what the space will fit. We also encourage you to think about, can you do without AV? We try to do the majority of our sessions as hands-on. As Ellen said, we know, our, we know in general, adults learn best through hands-on, and also our attendees, many of them are in professions where they're just very hands-on people. They, they like that hands-on learning. And so we try to focus on non-AV sessions. And so that'll open some, um, some doors for you if you eliminate AV. Next slide, please. 
So the one of the benefits of us going out into the communities like this is that we get to see firsthand what some technicians are struggling with. And we know that these are technicians that we don't see at our large state conferences. So there are what, what might be something we would plan for our large state conferences, we may be missing some of the challenges that some people are having. And so, you know, we think about what information can we leave them with um, that will give, that will make them a better CPS technician tomorrow. And so again, that focus on hands-on learning. So for example, maybe some of these rural communities don't see a lot of seats that have maybe load legs or something like that. And so they're not comfortable, they're not confident when somebody comes to them with that seat. We'll give them an activity where they're looking in manuals, they're looking at labels, they're touching the seats, they're installing the seats, they're all of those things so that when they're faced with that situation in the future, they're comfortable and ready to go. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we get all six CEUs in one day? It's all about maximizing time. Um, 75 to 105 minutes of technical content is one and a half CEUs. We, this is one example schedule that we have. We start a little bit later in the day and end a little bit earlier again to make it accessible. We don't want people, it's a large rural state. People are gonna have to drive to get here and we don't want them to have to incur a hotel cost because that may make it such that this is no longer attainable. So we want them to be able to commute and out in the same day. So we focus on 75 minutes of technical content per session. And I strongly suggest that you submit your CEUs for pre-approval ahead of time so that you can ensure that the content you plan to offer does count and meet that technical content requirement. Uh, next slide. So keep it simple, keep it consistent. We do not have specialized presentations. Any one of our state team can pick it up and do any part of it. Um, so that way, if somebody's not available, it's okay. There are many, there's a six of us that will do it and we can sub in and out as needed. Um, don't work harder than you need to. Only think once. We do the same agenda, bring the same materials and do the same content every time. Um, we have it all set up. We can grab it and go and be ready to go and set up in no time. Um, we um, will repeat this for about two years, recertification cycles, two years. So we have some flexibility there to repeat these content, this content over and over again in that two-year window. We may refresh it here and there as needed. Um, next slide. Other benefits. These are, as you can imagine, are administratively very easy to put together because we're not dealing with registration fees. We're not dealing with food vendors, hotel contracts, anything like that. Um, we don't have to deal with money. We don't have to deal with contracting. Alan and I both work for the government. You know, it's that's a long process to get some of those contracts through. We don't need to do that. We're not worrying about hotel blocks, travel, any of that for people coming in and out. Um, and another benefit is that the rural communities that we go to take great pride in hosting the event. They like pointing out their local restaurants. They like showing us what they're capable of, showing us, you know, their community and their programs. And, and they feel supported. You know, we don't want our technicians to ever feel like just because you're not in the big cities that, that we don't care whether or not you're certified because that, that's not the case at all. So by us going to them, we're telling them, it's a, we, we know that you may not have the ability to send your entire department to a state conference. That's okay. We're gonna come to you to make sure that you have what you need to stay recertified. Um, and to keep offering those services to the program, to the state. So with that next slide, these are our contact information. Alan and I are always happy to um, answer any questions you have, and that's it. All right, thank you, Alan and Bevan. Um, we are going to move on now. We're, so we've heard from three different states um, on their models, and now we're gonna bring in um, Daniela Brown with Up A Baby uh, to talk about the manufacturer perspective. Um, Daniela, um, having worked in the juvenile product industry since 2007, specifically in the car seat industry, Daniela brings her seasoned experience of manufacturing and development process to the board as the child path of the child seat manufacturer representative. Prior to working in the juvenile industry, Daniela was a vehicle seat engineer for more than eight years at Lear Corporation, working on projects for Ford and Mazda. She has an in-depth understanding of a vehicle's dynamics in a crash condition and how the body reacts to crash situations. 
Uh, so Daniela, it's all yours. Thanks, Crystal. Um, I just wanted to note that yes, um, although I am a representative on the board, I am here today speaking on behalf of Alpha Baby. Um, this is my contact information. I am also not driving in a vehicle. I am sitting in a vehicle in the passenger side. Um, and I apologize. Hopefully the connection works for me all the way through here as well. Um, so just to bring a different perspective from a manufacturer standpoint, you are going to hear some repetitive information. Um, but hopefully there is some new information you can gather from, from the few slides that I'm going to pre, pre, be presenting. Next slide, please. Okay. So prior to the event, um, and we've heard uh, various people mention this, so invite the manufacturers, like create a list of manufacturers. I know, for example, the Oppa Baby products are high end are higher end products. So you may want to um, not include up a baby products, for example, in your um, attendees list. So, you know, feel out what you see a lot of, or maybe if you wanna see new innovation, you might bring in some different manufacturers. Um, the MACPS, which is the Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety, there is a form on Safe Ride News where you can go through and see the manufacturers that are listed. There is a all of the contact information is there as well, which is great. And then you can toggle which manufacturers you would like to send the information about your conference to, to find out if they can attend. Um, the only thing I do want to point out is give enough time for scheduling and travel um, as well. So when, when you initially uh, reach out. So in other words, don't reach, I wouldn't recommend reaching out when you have two months until your conference, for example. Uh, number two, ask if they have any CEUs to present. The MACPS has CEUs and so do a lot of the manufacturers. And guess what? If they are attending, they are free. There are um, some technicians and instructors that do are, are compensated monetarily, obviously, um, to come and present at the conference. I am saying that if you ask one of the manufacturers to attend, it's not going to cost you anything because we're going anyway to, and our companies send us to these locations to educate on the product. We also have CEUs that have been through Safe Kids and have been approved, although Bevan's right, that needs to be sent out to Stephanie and team there to get your whole agenda approved. But a lot of the times, the ones that we have developed have been used in the past. Um, so that is a wonderful option for you because again, it's free. One thing I do want to point out is not all the car seat manufacturers are representatives on the MACPS. So you, I just threw some various logos here on the right-hand side of that list right there. Two of them are not part of the MACPS, which is not a big deal, but I like to point that out because Regardless of MACPS or not, you should be trying to reach all the manufacturers and all of them do have um, information to contribute. Uh, obviously, this has been mentioned to consider the location. So from the manufacturer standpoint, um, a lot of times we have to consider travel in and out. Um, a lot of us have a budget. So we have to budget our hotels and our rental cars and our air airline tickets. So depending on how close you are to busier airports, that can obviously bring some of that cost down for us. Um, there are some state states that actually also provide some type of um, compensation for hotel stays too. And there are some manufacturers that take advantage of that as well, which is great. Um, so if you have the funds to be able to support that, wonderful. It is not always necessary is one thing I do want to point out though. Um, having the hotel, restaurants, activities all close by is a great incentive, not just for the manufacturers, but for your attendees and the shipment of material in and out. So just make sure that when you send out that initial invite and you've gotten the response and then you go to the next step of communication, just ensure that you have outlined how our materials should be shipped in for the conference and how we are able to ship out. Next slide, please. All right, so during the conference, utilize the manufacturers, and you've heard this numerous times, hands-on sessions are always something that we love as manufacturers because we get to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And I don't know about you, but I find that a lot of people tend to learn better when there are hands-on sessions. 
there is always usually a manufacturer's panel. So take advantage of them being there. Usually those last eight to 10 minutes, you have someone that coordinates it and keeps the manufacturers on time, like a mediator kind of thing. And just to obviously ensure that your whole conference is staying on time. And it's nice because it gives us a platform to just say what we have to say once. There are some positives and negatives to it, but from a manufacturer's perspective, it's really hard to be to kind of do these dropout groups and then having to repeat yourself um, about you know four to five times. So that can be difficult sometimes. But if that's the option, then we are flexible. A car seat check as Indiana does, and they do a wonderful job. Uh, that's always a great and a great thing. If you guys are having it, invite the manufacturers to come and attend and support. A lot of them are instructors. We can help sign off. And we are the go-to right there on property for information on the products, which is wonderful. And CEUs, as I mentioned, set up teardown, just making sure that there's ample time in the, the schedule that you send out to allow for setup time and teardown time. Some miscellaneous suggestions. When sessions are um, in, in place, when everyone is broken out and they've gone to all of these breakout rooms, just a suggestion to um, close the exhibit hall if you can. Sometimes it's tough um, and this is this can go both ways, but sometimes it's tough because we as manufacturers like to attend these sessions as well and gather information just like you because we learn just like you. And then it also gives us a, a time to catch up on some of the outside stuff that we do outside of just being here at the conference um, and gives us a break from talking all the time. So just, you know, as, as just a great um, kind of miscellaneous suggestion. And then closing the exhibit hall during a lunch or allowing the time to eat prior to visiting time. So just something like we've, we've I think, tended conferences and that in some cases we have our plates sitting on our laps and we have people come up that are coming to, from to look at the um, look at the products and stuff, which is wonderful. But I always feel awful and they feel awful approaching me when I've got food in my mouth and I'm just like, hold on a second. So even if you give us 15 to 20 minutes to just kind of gobble down that food um, before we start those visiting times, that would be a, a nice suggestion. Um, next slide, please. And then following the event. So the product, the manufacturers, when we attend, typically we leave our product for training. And generally speaking, it is for training, training um, either for the technician, usually it's for the instructor teams. Um, you will find some cases, well, the manufacturers will allow it for personal use, but I think that's a great incentive to update all your training kits. Um, shipment, it's always wonderful having that assistance shipping out. Um, I know with myself, I had to run to catch a flight and we, I've had so many wonderful conferences that have offered to just kind of take anything that I need to ship out um, and ship it, ship it back, which is rare, but it does happen. So thank you. That's a great thing. And then the survey, send out to the manufacturers as well as your attendees, but it helps with the lessons learned. Um, and it also kind of helps build that community between the manufacturers and you as conference um, attendees and conference coordinators, just because, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we learn. At, not every conference is the same. So it's always nice to get that feedback. So that would be my only last point. And finally, the last slide is just my contact information. Um, did I go, did I freeze? Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. Um, this is my contact information. Very quickly, there's um, also, the Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety, you can find all of that on saferidenews.com, and that is our email address as well, which you can find on Safe Ride News um, website. So thank you, Crystal. Thank you so much, Daniela. Okay, we have one more presentation um, focused on CEUs. Um, so I'm going to introduce Stephanie Heisch now. With more than 20 years of injury prevention experience and as a longtime CPS technician instructor, Stephanie brings a wealth of knowledge to the Safe Kids Worldwide team. Among her many responsibilities, Stephanie leads efforts to provide new technical information to CPS technicians through local updates, webinars, and other outreach. Stephanie started her career with Safe Kids in 2002 as a state coordinator for Wyoming. Quote, keeping children safe is my passion, and I know we can all have a positive impact and make a difference every day in the lives of our children. All right, Stephanie, you're up. 
Hi, everybody. I'm just going to wrap it up. Great information. It was wonderful to hear all that. And I just want to bring it all together and very quickly want, want to just show you one of the things that is asked is who do I go to at Safe Kids Worldwide and for what? And so the team consists of Wordell um, in customer service. So anything to do with customer service. Myself, you see there the CEU pre-approvals, and that's what I'm going to talk about very quickly today, as well as tech proxy apps, instructor candidate applications, nursing, um, the continuing education credits. And then for any audit questions, the auditor is at CPS audit at safekids.org. Next slide. And then Cass Herring is the advisor. So any technical content policies and procedures would go to Cass. And then Shushana is any general certification questions or feedback would go to Shushana. So for today, though, next slide, I'm just going to wrap this up a little bit with um, you've heard many of the speakers talking about getting CEUs pre-approved. It is a good idea to have your CEUs pre-approved. Those would come to me. And the reason for that is you're going to get an event ID number and you are going to have that assurance that that event ID number has been looked at. If there's anything I need to discuss with you, I'm going to get a hold of you. We're going to talk about it. And then we're going to be able to get you your CEU credits. The biggest thing to remember about CEUs that are approved is that they are improving CPS technical knowledge. So anything that the technician has already learned in the certification course, if it is a review of latch plates, retractors, that is not improving as graded as it is. It's not improving and going further with their technical knowledge. And then I'm going to give you some examples very quickly about that. But there you will need, if you can go back just for one second, you will need to show a proof of attendance. So that is whether it's a certificate, an email, a letter. And we do ask that you keep those on file for two years from the date provided because that is their certification cycle. And as you heard some of the other speakers talking about, the pre-approved sessions are good for one year. And then you will need to get a new event ID number after the one year, mainly so that we make sure technical content is kept up to date. Now, next slide, thank you. And then here are some examples of what would be acceptable and unacceptable for CEUs. So on the left-hand side, you can see there the acceptable and all of those would fall under improving technical knowledge. And then on the unacceptable, as much as running an inspection station is great or the other things that you see there, it's not going with that technical knowledge of car seats. So the way that I had to wrap myself around it when I first started approving CEUs was anything that is new, anything that is going forward, that is going to be acceptable as as well as it does need to be technical content for the car seats. And I just want to let you know that the great thing to look at very quickly is if you go to the website, the cert.safekids.org, and you go under the, on the far right side, resources, FAQs, and you look under I'm a tech providing CEUs, you are going to see some questions that are on there that are great information. How many hours, how many CEUs will I get? And other questions that will be answered. So I'm going to stop and give a couple minutes for questions. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and we do, we have a couple of things to do with you all really quickly before we get to the closing announcement. Um, Jess has queued up a poll. Uh, there was a question uh, sent to me about how many states do a car seat check. So she's going to put that up. But while she is doing that and you're answering that question, uh, we did have one question in the chat that doesn't really got a chance to be addressed. And so I'm going to read that one out. And it's to North Carolina. Um, it's Alan and Bevan. Is there any reason why you don't offer a public seat check even at your symposiums? How do techs get seat, their seat checked in the rural areas? Um, so in North Carolina, we rely heavily on our uh, technician proxies. We've heavily embraced that program throughout our state. We have over 100 technician proxies in addition to our 40 or so um, instructors. So 
we're not opposed to offering a seat check, but the focus of these events are on the CEUs and to get people in and out in one day. Adding an event will add multiple hours and you know, we prefer to encourage those relationships with their local communities So, because we're not always going to be there. So we want them to, um, to develop the relationship with their local proxies so that they can continue long term getting recertified. Um, also, you know, there's four, maybe five of us instructors there, 25 to 50 students. There's just no way we can get everyone what they need um, at a uh, car seat check in the short amount of time that we're there. So. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Stephanie, there's one to you about CEUs. Um, how many CEUs for the NDCF sessions? Yeah, and I just saw that and I was replying to that, but thank you for that. Um, it, the If you are just reviewing how to use the digital check form, that would be great community education, not necessarily for a CEU. But if you are taking that data that you have gotten from the digital check form, and now you are going to use that data on improving use of the car seats, that would work for a CEU. All right, great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go through these closing announcements very quickly. Um, so let's see, um, wanted to let you all know that we have um, an upcoming board webinar um, and hope that you can share it with your techs and instructors in your state. So in March, we're going to be doing tribal outreach in child passenger safety. So we hope that you join members of the National Child Passenger Safety Board for community education about building those partnerships with tribal communities. Uh, and you can register at cpsboard.org forward slash webinars. Um, and all of the materials have for pre-recorded webinars and child passenger safety trainings have moved to a new home, um, a much a very well-organized home. Um, so you can find that information on carseateducation.org. There is a whole um, catalog, course catalog, where you can look through to find the trainings that would best suit you. And wanted to remind everybody um, that cpsboard.org has um, information and resources for technicians, instructors, CPS coordinators, parents and giver, caregivers, um, and of course the NDCF. Um, and please join us for a free orientation training on how to use the National Digital Checklist form or check form. Sessions are held monthly and you can register for one of those at CPS board.org forward slash webinars. And next month, the coordinators forum will be Wednesday, March 22nd at 2 p.m. Um, and it's going to be about heat stroke prevention planning with National Heat Stroke Prevention Day coming up May 1st. This is a great time to start planning efforts to increase awareness and reduce these tragic and preventable deaths. So a reminder that carseateducation.org offers a free online course that documents the three primary circumstances that have led to child, children dying in hot cars and what we can all do to prevent these deaths. So for organizations wanting to use these free resources as a training, we are able to set up a free group delivery. Um, designated group admins are able to enroll students in the training, track their progress and run training completion reports. So if that's something you're interested in, you can contact training at cpsboard.org. Um, and as always, we are open to suggestions for the CPS Coordinators Forum. Um, please email these ideas to secretariat at cpsboard.org or throw them in the chat right now and we'll gather those. Um, we'd love to hear from you on topics you would like to hear. So just want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, the recording will be put up in one to two days. Um, I just lost, there we go, at um, cpsboard.org forward slash cps dot or dash coordinators dash forum. Um, hope everyone has a safe day. Thank you for joining us. And here are the results for the poll for those who are still on the call. And Jess, you can probably stop the recording. <laughs>